In the town of Pomfret, the men get together two or three times a week to dig graves. This week it's for a young woman who's died of AIDS. But today the routine is broken by a visitor, the man they call their father, Colonel Jan Breitenbach. <laughs> These men once fought side by side on the battlefields of Angola. Once they were the most feared, most decorated unit in the South African Defense Force. Today they feel like the persecuted, their village is threatened with destruction. Breitenbach has come to say goodbye. It's 1975. Angola is on the eve of independence from Portugal. Three Angolan liberation movements have been fighting for over a decade for control of their fatherland. The MPLA has massive backing from the Soviet Union and Cuba. UNITA gets arms and funding from America and South Africa. But there's a third movement, the National Front for the Liberation of Angola, or FNLA, which is slowly being driven out. They have no outside support. They flee south and in the small town of Mpupa, on the Angolan border with Namibia, their fortunes collide with those of the South African government. I made contact with them. We, we didn't know the time who we were in, actually in control of, of, of Mpupa, whether it was UNITA or MPLA or, or, or FNA. So that was quite a, 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 an egg dancing experience to, to, to go and make contact with these people who didn't know who they were. Colonel Jan Breitenbach had been sent by the chief of the South African Defence Force to recruit Angolan fighters. They would help the SADF crack down on guerrilla infiltration from Angola into Southwest Africa. They looked like what they were, bank robbers and uh, thieves. Of course, uh, Angola was falling apart, you see, and everybody was for himself and they had to make a living and so on. But they looked they, they look awful. They were covered in sores, they had no boots and they had, amongst a lot of them, I think there were only about 300 of them there then on that day, uh, they had eight rifles. What was supposed to be a tentative exploration of ways to collaborate changed Breitenbach's role in the war completely. An interpreter called Pelisa steered history on this new course. I was going to give them training aids. I, I, I helped them with uh, training them and equipping them and nothing more. Advice, that's it. But on the parade ground, Pelisa started you know, spouting forth in Portuguese to these guys. And eventually he, uh, he uh, turned around and saluted me and he said he wants to congratulate me. I've just been appointed the FNA commander of this battalion. <laughs> they lost their war against the MPLA, but to this day, these men believe they fought a just war against communism in Angola and South Africa. That's what Breitenbach had recruited them for. 30 years ago, they were refugees. Today, with the threat of relocation hanging over them, they're again on the brink of displacement. Africa do Sul receberam a independência foi através de nós. We work for South Africa, um, and that South Africa is independent because of us. And it wasn't the Blue Berets, the, the United Nations, who gave South Africa independence. It was them. It was they're the ones who fought, and now they're abandoned. Angela McIntyre is an oral history researcher from Wits University. She's recording the history of the veterans that's fast being forgotten. I was very aware from the beginning of this project that I was going to face a challenge in terms of getting people to speak to me and getting people to open up and to tell their stories. People were warning me, oh, you're never going to find those guys. They're never going to speak to you. They have too many skeletons in the closet. I've, I've actually found people to be remarkably open and talkative. Angela's work in Pomfret began about a year ago. On her first visit, she heard that in January 2004, a General Bobo Moirani from the new SANDF had come to Pomfret. He came to announce that the community was to move. Pomfret would be demolished. General Moirani said every structure would be razed to the ground come end of last year. A community is a, it's a support network. It's a vibrant and organic thing. And um, particularly in the case where you have a very culturally unique community like the one at Pomfret, to tear it apart, I think, would have very tragic consequences uh, for many of the community members, particularly the more vulnerable ones, the orphans, um, the, the, the disabled veterans. The Pomfret community came together through strife and displacement. In November 1975, after barely any training, the Buffalo soldiers set off from their refuge of Mpupa to fight the mighty MPLA. For 20 years, they worked for the South African Army. They rallied around the man they called Carpenter, Colonel Breitenbach. 
he wasn't afraid to put himself in the line of fire. Um, and he, he stood out as an example for his troops. He wasn't someone who sort of stayed in the rear echelons and gave orders from behind. He was, I think he was always at the forefront. And, um, you know, he, he, he tells stories of troops sometimes who were afraid and he would literally grab them by the scruffs of their neck and, and haul them up and tell them, you know, shoot, shoot, don't just sit there. The first time they saw actually that these guys going in with them. Uh, so they, there was a sort of subtle switch of, of loyalty from the FNLA, uh, uh, a loyalty to the FNLA and, their, and, and what it stood for, to, to, to these, these funny buggers from the South East Sea who actually were fighting this war as if it's their personal war. The loyalties forged in battle were profound. As the unit's reputation grew, 32 Battalion became a favoured destination for many a white national serviceman. Service with 32 Battalion looked good on a CV. For 20 years, the apartheid government's operational orders kept coming in from Pretoria. Go for broke, keep Swapo out of Southwest and the MPLA and communism out of South Africa. More and more FNLA refugees and their families came here, Buffalo Base, on the Kavango River in the Caprivi Strip of northern Namibia. Then Namibia gained independence in 1989 and the South African army had to withdraw. There was no question, 32 Battalion had to move too. They could never hope to return and live under the Angolan government that they'd fought. But the army generals promised them they'd be looked after, promised them a new home in the foreign country they'd sacrificed almost 20 years for. And so the epic trek to South Africa began, by road, by train and by plane. Pomfret was an old asbestos mine. It's two hours drive north of Freiburg in what is today the northwest province. The SADF had the mine rehabilitated and then built a base and thousands of houses. Pomfret is the largest settlement in the rural Malopo municipality which consists of 13,000 residents. After the Caprivi, Pomfret was cold, dry and alien. 32 Battalion had just settled in here when they were called up to quell faction fights between the ANC and IFP on Johannesburg's East Rand and in KwaZulu-Natal. The opportunities for, for misdeployment had opened up. Um, you know, they, they, they got involved in work that I think would have been more appropriate for police. They themselves say that, that we were, we were a military unit, we were not, we were not a police force. Um, they hated the work in the townships. They found it to be far more dangerous than what they'd done on the border. They found it dishonorable um, and they found it generally distasteful. Policing the townships on the orders of their national party bosses sounded the death knell for 32 Battalion. They were seen to be part of what became known as Apartheid's destabilizing third force. Not surprisingly, the incoming ANC government wanted the discredited, hated unit disbanded. In 1993, 32 Battalion learned of their fate on television. After 17 years service in three countries, 3-2 Battalion has been officially disbanded. It was at 3-2 Battalion's base at Pomfret in the Northern Cape that the unit, arguably the most well-known and successful unit to serve South Africa during the Bush War, was officially disbanded. Members of this proud unit will now be transferred to other units within the South African Defence Force. Past and present members of the unit, however, feel sold out by what they call the politically motivated destruction of the best unit in the Southern Hemisphere. I feel we've been betrayed, let down, because the uh, politicians were using the, uh, this unit's political power. And I don't think it's right, because uh, they bled for this country. This man promised he would never be disbanded. Okay. P.W. Boota promised you would never be disbanded. F.W. De Klerk promised you would never be disbanded. Three weeks later, F.W. De Klerk disbanded you. Three weeks later, F.W. De Klerk disbanded you.
he betrayed you. For them, the betrayal did not stop there. Soon after 32 Battalion was disbanded, the Defence Force withdrew completely from Pomfret. This community of ill-adjusted, isolated civilians was left to fend for themselves. For more than a decade, the veterans and their families have been relying on each other and social grants. Few are still strong enough to work. They do what they know, work in private security. Living conditions have been slowly getting worse. And then the general came with an order for their removal. Nós havíamos vivido bem desde o tempo com os brancos, agora vamos viver mal, tem que essa, essa povo aqui tem que acabar. Porque os nativos, os nativos estão vivendo na miséria, na, lá no esquimbo deles, não tem casa, vocês têm água em luz, tem, tem as, as casas privadas, não se pode. Então ele disse, cada mês vai vir começar a levar pessoas para ir aonde que a pessoa vai. Porque o municipality contribuiu com o general Morani para escrever os papéis, assinar aonde que tu queres ir. As outras pessoas escreveram, eu disse, eu não sou escravo, não vou escrever. Ele é que vem me matar aqui no Pão Freire. You can be proud that you are veterans of the best battalion ever in the South African Army. Colonel Jan Breitenbach's visit comes at a time when a morale boost is sorely needed. The people have been told to put their names on a list. They must choose townships in the province where they want RDP houses. General Bobo Moirani said it's because of asbestos that they must move, but no one here believes him. We're also talking about the veteran wives. Dia 15 de janeiro, quando veio, conversou com, com as pessoas no salão da comunidade. Ali até eu tinha levantado para dizer que o general Moran, antes de nós mudar, primeiro queremos tirar radiografia para ver se temos abestos, porque aonde que vou, vou morrer na mesma. Se tenho, tem que pagar primeiro. Why was this asbestos question not addressed much earlier? Why have they been left to languish there with this with this, this, this obvious you know, health threat under their noses for so long? Why wasn't this given any consideration earlier? Então, a primeira palavra que ele falou, que eu venho como um business aqui. Ninguém que fala, que estou como de falar, nada, sou eu que fala. Você escuta o que eu estou falando, nada a pessoa que pode falar mais. Então, nós todos aqui tivemos parado toda essa comunidade. Ninguém abria a boca. E ele disse que esse pão que vai fechar. E essas casas todas que estão aqui, tudo vai ser limpado, tudo. O trator vai passar nessas casas. No, no fim de junho, metade do conflito vai sair. Nós todos esperamos até o fim de junho. Ninguém saiu. Dezembro, que ela disse que no dezembro, nem o capi do Pão Fred já não vai existir. Tudo vai ser limpado. You know, I think there was general, general suspicion of this as a motive for their, for their removal. You know, something that gave rise to this suspicion was the, let's call it the non-dialogue that took place between the community and, um, and the authorities, and in particular General Morani. You know, I, I don't think there was any effort made to make the process transparent or participatory. One would think that if the, the real cause for the removal was some kind of a health crisis, that the people would be given as much information as possible. It baffled the people of Pomfret that 17 years ago they'd been told to come to Pomfret. It was safe. The asbestos mine had been rehabilitated. There was no problem. Everyone knows about Yenungfle, 70 kilometers away. Here you still see blue asbestos carpeting the area. The asbestos mine is totally unrehabilitated, but no one here has been told to get ready to move. Nowhere in Pomfret do you see this much asbestos. Special assignment requested copies of the reports on which government has based their far-reaching decisions. The community certainly has not been shown them. Neither were we. Repeated requests for interviews with the Defence Force and General Moirani were declined. Ons mensen wat hier geboren is, are groot geworden. Ik mean, in algemeen nou waar ever is ek moest nou die asbest maar reeds my lang het, dan is het moest nou daar. So dan kan ek moest nou maar net so wel aangaan nie, so maar verder die bly. Wel, my broer is 50 en ek is 40 en um, ons toets gereeld en nie een van ons weet hy gaan jaarliks um, ook vir a, vir a, vir a ek, ek straal en nie een van ons het nog die stadium enig geskaar in. Susan Bonet runs the old army store. It used to turn over nearly a million rand. Today the stock is barely worth 30,000. And since few people have any money and there are no efforts at job creation, business is slow. Susan knows this community very well and she knows why they believe they're being moved. The great reason 
wat ons van die begin af gezet. En hoe kom ik het sê is, is omdat hulle nie vir die mensen saam op een plek wil laat blijven. nie. Hulle wil hulle verspreid. So, die groot rede, denk ek, is dat die mensen maar vir hulle bedreiging is. General Morani's announcement came at a time when um, there was a lot of attention in the press um, being given to the coup attempt in Equatorial Guinea. Um, Sixty some odd members of 3-2 Battalion and Kufut and the old Defence Force were were imprisoned at the time, uh, Chikarubi prison in, 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 in Zimbabwe. I, I, I recall the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time making a statement to the effect that we don't want South Africa to be perceived as a cesspool of mercenaries. And I, I think that this drew some attention to Pomfret. Security is the only trade these men know. They've worked as mercenaries in Angola and Sierra Leone and as security guards in Iraq and Afghanistan. Two Pomfret men were among the coup plotters arrested in Zimbabwe. General Moirani didn't exactly come out and say so, but these men believe this is what's causing their problems. Even the youngsters and the wives, who never served in 32 Battalion, but moved along to South Africa, are now fighting for their survival. Domingo Sebastião was one of the young men in the community who attended meetings with the general. I think it has something to do with the security because he mentioned somewhere along the way when he got a little bit angry that we are security threat to the country and, and I don't know. So I think the main reason might only be that because I cannot see why the politicians are not getting involved because we ask politicians to come and visit us so that we can discuss it with them. So when people say that this band of bad people are mercenaries to go and just to go and get money and do this, I would rather say, yes, there are some companies who do that, but all of them are based within Pretoria and, and, and Johannesburg, right in the noses of the government officials. And then the people heard that the Northwest MEC for Local Government and Housing, Peña Vilakazi, had actually said they were the problem. That particular person said, no, Pomfret was a problem in the past. Pomfret is a problem in the present and Pomfret is a problem outside the borders of the country. So now it tells me it has got nothing to do with asbestos. It has got to do with the members of community. The people of Pomfret believe they will never live down being on the wrong side of history. And now they will lose the only neighbors they can rely on. They know they won't be welcome in any township where they may choose to live. But the MEC says there are no hard feelings. There isn't. If there was, I would be the first one to have taken revenge. Because I can tell you what happened to me when I was in my melody. Uh, and uh, Battalion 21 was responsible. I can relate those stories. Today I'd had to negotiate with municipalities. It was not easy. There is a municipality that said to us, they don't come here. If they come here, this, the next night we'll wipe them out. So the negotiations have not been easy. The community has appealed to the Human Rights Commission, the Red Cross and the South African Council of Churches to stop the move, to find out the truth about their health, to find a way to stay together. So far, they've heard nothing. Local and provincial government firmly deny any motives other than asbestos. But there's pressure to get going. In the last month, the first six families were notified they should get ready. But they still don't know when any of this will happen. Pomfret for me is a, is, it's a test case for the new South Africa. It's, it's a test of tolerance. It's a test of people's ability to accept uh, people who are different. Um, it's a test of, of service delivery. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a test of, it's a test of humanity. Since the people of Pomfret were told they'd be moving, government services have slowly been withdrawn. The police have moved out. The municipal offices closed down. Social workers are never seen. The clinic barely operates. Water runs only sporadically. Sewerage is broken down. At the high school, the matric failure rate shot up at the end of last year. Uncertainty has taken the wind out of everyone's sails. Small plans to improve one's life have been put on hold. Estamos morrendo nas casas sem comida, estamos morrendo nas casas sem caixão, estamos morrendo nas casas sem hospital, estamos a morrer 
em casa sem água, sem luz. Luz vem há três, quatro dias sem a luz. Três, quatro dias sem água, cinco dias sem água, assim é uma vivência de uma pessoa. Não é boa a situação. Estamos a sofrer. Estamos a sofrer mesmo assim. Só Deus é que está a nos tomar conta, porque toda a semana podia ser três, quatro mortos, cinco, seis mortos, mas Jesus Cristo está, nos, está a olhar a nossa vida. Não estamos a viver porque temos boa, bom tratamento ou está a nos tomar bem conta. É Deus que está a nos tomar conta. The community has become uninhabitable over this period of time. And whether this is some kind of a scorched earth uh, strategy, you know, to, to, to drive people out, um, it, it, it's not working. Um, Pomfret is the home of those people and they're not moving. But government says it's not negotiable. They say Pomfret is not an island that can demand special treatment. The people must be integrated into South African society, even if they're old, disabled or orphaned and can only speak Portuguese. In a year from now, special assignment was assured Pomfret would no longer exist. This is a South African problem. It's not a political problem. It may be political because we have this uh, background, we have these experiences with them. But now these are South African citizens. As a matter of fact, they carry IDs of South Africa. Some of them have not been to their country of origin. They were born in South Africa. So they are part of me. You see, they may have done all those things that happened. I have equally done some of the things. But we have come into an era where there must be reconciliation. And if people thought it was reconciliation between President Mandela and F.W. Hitler, no. It's reconciliation even at that street level. Once again, the people of Pomfret don't see anything reconciliatory in what's happening to them. It seems nobody can help not even the man they still see as their savior. It was uh, a, a, a emotionally a debilitating experience for me uh, to see what uh, they are back where they were in Mapupa. Uh, and worse off because then you could offer them something? I could offer them something, I can't offer them anything. I've got no, I've got no means to offer them anything. And, uh, because I could get back up then, and I, uh, what, what do you do? You see, you feel so helpless.